Hello, everyone. My name is John Mason, Manager of Investment Technologies and Operations at Versant Capital Management, a wealth management and investment firm located in Phoenix, Arizona. Today, I'm talking with Carl Bickmore, CEO of SnapTech IT, a company with an expert team of technology professionals that helps firms like ours manage their long and short term technology needs. Carl is going to discuss cybersecurity, something that has been in the news a lot lately. He's going to help us understand what to avoid to be a victim, being a victim of cybercrime. Carl, welcome. Thanks, John. Appreciate it. Good seeing you again. Nice talking with you. Uh, maybe uh, some of you probably don't know this, but John and I have actually been working together for several years now uh, on the technology there at Versant, and it's uh, it's fun to be here to help. And I, I'm hopefully hopefully we can share some good information and and that people will find it interesting. So thank you for the invite. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, kick off the presentation now, if that's all right. Sounds good. Okay, great. So this is some thoughts that John and I put together as we were working through thinking about what would be the kind of the best messaging for your audience and, and for the folks out there. And, and really, it's something that I've been seeing is kind of a disturbing uh, trend out there. Uh, and so I'm calling it the elephant in the room, which is the cybersecurity readiness that kind of everybody has gotten to a spot where they know that they need to improve their cybersecurity readiness, but they're either not sure how, or they might sh think that maybe it won't be so bad for them. And uh, and so let's talk about it. Let's talk about what it means uh, potentially for you personally and maybe in your business context as well. Uh, so, you know, we hear about it every day. If you're following the news in any format, in any place, you're probably hearing about cybersecurity attacks, uh, ransomware attacks, of course, there's some ones that have been very um, well covered in the media as of recent, but in my industry, we see and know about them every single day on a regular basis, and uh, and there's way more than are, are reported in the news. It's a very, very persistent issue that is, is out there, but the key thing is, is the question you should be asking is, are you ready for an attack? Are you ready for that to come your direction? And you know the reality of it is, is what we're seeing out there in the disruption is that the attackers are not really inventing a lot of new methods. And in fact, fundamentally the basics, if you cover them, you're very likely to, to reduce your risk. You're very likely to avoid an issue. And so that's the thing that I find stark and amazing is because we get involved with organizations that have been attacked, we get called in to help with the incident response. And invariably, when we do, there's only a handful of things that were conditions that were true, that if they had just been taken care of, and I would consider them the basics, um, that they, they probably would not have had that attack uh, happen. Uh, and so it's a, it's a fundamental problem out there. It's a level of education that needs to be generally spread through the population, through businesses, through people personally, that there's a few things that if you can do them, you, you can really reduce the effectiveness of this out there. And so uh, I think that uh, this is the big secret or the elephant in the room is that they're not inventing a lot of new ways to, to hack your systems, as they say, excuse me, <coughs> but they are, um, still very effectively getting to lots of people because of these basics. So let's, we'll talk about that a little bit. Let's look at a few attacks that we've recently uh, become aware of. Um, one that uh, um, hit the news and, uh, and really affected the folks in the Eastern United States recently was the Colonial Pipeline uh, uh, breach that occurred. And of course, that affected gasoline supplies uh, to your local gas station. And so people uh, suddenly realized there was going to be a supply issue with gasoline and there was a, a run on gas stations. In fact, we have an office located in the Atlanta area and it's very directly affected by it as our people were struggling, like, can I make it to work? Can I get gas? Um, and it was really just the effect of the company that manages the pipeline had computers just like any other business. They're not specifically configured in any certain way or specifically protected by our military or defense industrial base. They're simply just a company that, uh, that runs this system that's a critical infrastructure piece for the United States. And they, they had um, a few pretty basic things wrong in their environment. For, for instance, that particular attack was successful because 
uh, they had an account for a user that had been in their uh, system previously that had been terminated, that was no longer active, but they uh, had never gone in and disabled that account from the ability to log in, which means that the attackers were able to continually try to get into that account and nobody noticed because they didn't have monitoring of it and they weren't managing inactive accounts. And to me, that's a pretty basic thing. It's like, don't have a username and password that's active and functional in your business or for your systems if it's not uh, act actively needed. Uh, it just provides a pathway in. There was a couple other things about that, you know, because this was an attack on a business. Uh, they, they also didn't have what's called multi-factor authentication turned on for their remote access, which allowed another way for them to very easily just continually try passwords on this dormant account until they eventually found their way in. And once they were in, they were able to uh, begin the attack and spreading and causing the, the ransomware event. Um, now, just uh, we'll, we'll talk about it probably a little bit more in the future too, but multi-factor authentication, by the way, is something each of you should be asking yourself, is this something that we, that we wanna do in our uh, business? And is this something I wanna do personally whenever I'm working with um, an email account or some type of solution, uh, do I want to enable multi-factor authentication? And at the most basic level, multi-factor authentication is that not only do you know one factor, a username and password, for instance, but you have a second factor to log in. Sometimes you receive a, a text code or you have a little application on your phone that will tell you a, a number to type in along with your password. They're called one-time passwords or one-time codes. Um, Whenever you enable those, believe it or not, you are reducing the surface of the attack to your personal systems or to your business by 72%. That's a pretty significant number, which means a lot of successful attacks are just simple guessing usernames and passwords. Um, and that's something to take, take care or take note of because that's a basic thing that we all have control of. We all choose our passwords and many systems offer you the ability to use multi-factor authentication, but perhaps you don't take advantage of it or you're like, oh, that sounds like extra work. But then again, this is one of the basics is if you turn on multi-factor authentication, you're less likely to be uh, successfully hacked and have your information stolen or your files held ransom, so forth, so on. The uh, Colonial Pipeline breach was, so it was just that simple, an inactive account and no multi-factor authentication. There was also a very significant uh, attack on Microsoft's email server that they call Microsoft Exchange. Uh, this is oftentimes referred to as the Hafnium attack. And as recent, uh, um, it, as recent news has uh, talked about, they're actually identifying that it was most likely put out there by a Chinese nation state actor, meaning a hacking group that is sponsored and paid for by the, uh, um, the, the Chinese uh, government. There's a few of those out there. The United States CERT organization monitors them and, and, and uh, lists them and warns people about them for those that are signed up to receive those warnings. And it looks like that attack was on them. But here's an idea of the scope of that attack. That particular attack uh, was uh, affecting hundreds and thousands of companies here in the United States that were all running that ex exchange email server software. There was very few exchange servers in existence that were out there functioning that did not get this attack, did not in some way become compromised. It was shocking. But here's the here's the dirty secret about that. When we, once again, back to basics is there are some IT folks out there managing these servers a lot of folks have moved off of Exchange service and gone to the Microsoft Office 365 or have gone to the Google G Suite application. And so they're not functioning with these older Microsoft Exchange servers. Um, it, but the the other thing is, is that the Hafnium attack, all they did was see a posted security fix that Microsoft had put out a patch for, saw what the vulnerability was, and they decided to write a program that would look for all the exchange servers with that vulnerability that would then gain access to the system and allow them to then take control and, and begin uh, their various types of hacking attacks. And so it was actually born out of an existing patch that just simply hadn't been applied. And so that's something for us all to think about when we're thinking about the basics, because a lot of us get prompts uh, to update software or we get prompts for our computers to update or for our phones. And sometimes we don't want to take the time to do them. And I guess I would just encourage you to think 
maybe differently about patching because it's a pretty straightforward process for an attacker to look at patches, what was listed as fixed, and then write hacks, and then just bet that a lot of people haven't applied the patch. And that was basically what was going on with that particular attack. Um, another one local here in Arizona where, um, where I'm from and where uh, Versant Capital Management Offices are, are uh, uh, headquartered, the, uh, there's a, a company we were brought into last year that um, opened up a what's called RDP or remote desktop port uh, directly to the IT person's machine. The IT person at this particular company that does, uh, they have about 200 employees here in Arizona. They do trade services for cons in the construction area. They um, had the, their IT guy was looking to gain a quick, easy way to do remote access to his system. Um, and unfortunately, inside of the web browser of his system, he had stored all the passwords uh, for the various IT things that would gain access to their network, to their backups, to their cloud services inside the web browser, which generally is, is a risk. It's, it's a not a great way to go. And so they're able to find the hack of getting into the remote desktop because he opened it up without, once again, multi-factor authentication. And he opened it up without any kind of restriction on it, really, other than just had to have a username and password. And once again, they were able to figure out a way to get in. And then once they gained control of his machine, they were able to get into the web browser and see all the usernames and passwords. And, and basically before they initiated their attack, they went and found their backup systems and deleted all their backups. And then they initiated a command to ransom all of their live files, which made it impossible for them to service their customers and until they were able to get past them because they didn't have their functional backup separated and the passwords were also compromised through that, that IT person's web browser, they were able to um, prevent the company from recovering without paying the ransom, which they ended up needing to do. Um, and so it's an, interesting, it's an interesting time that this is so prevalent and there's so many examples of this. I could really go on and on, but to be perfectly frank, you know, these um, are well-established security no-nos and these are basics, um, either for your business or at home, that you're you're following some well-established things that if you simply do them, uh, you're going to be able to prevent a lot of the risk that, that comes your way towards a computer hack or information being stolen. It's probably worth saying that there's, you know, no thing that you can do that 100% will prevent it. But really what you want to do is avoid being the low-hanging fruit that is not taking care of the basics because the basics are still very productive for the hackers. So it's important for you to know, it can be just one click. You need to be careful when you are answering an email that you know for sure who it's from and be very leery of emails that ask for personal information or passwords anything that might be used to gain access to you or to one of your clients or one of your friends. Something we've seen a lot of is uh, a person that's a financial institution, perhaps an accountant for a company or for a person actually gets hacked and then they send emails to their clients pretending to be operating as that accountant office and uh, asking for authorizations of things like fi uh, financial transfers. Another one we see really regularly is people get emails that are in the HR department of businesses asking for people to change their direct deposit for their paycheck. Uh, and they'll use that to get the paycheck routed to the hackers instead of the person who then thinks they didn't get paid and doesn't know why, what, what happened. And so there's uh, just an endless array of this, but it really comes down to you as a person in front of the computer being really careful when you're web doing a search on the web, you know, you go to Google or Bing and you type in a web search, you see all these results that you're, you're judicious about the links you're going to and looking for them to be coming from known or reputable sites or just very careful if they ask you to do anything that could provide a uh, secure uh, breach or insecure information being shared. Um, and so those are some things to think about. It really can happen with just one click uh, to infect your systems. So here's some of the things we talk about, some of the basics that we see out there. Once again, using simple passwords, not changing them for years is a really common, common way. A lot of folks reuse passwords between every 
uh, thing that they have passwords for as well, which is understandable because passwords are frustrating. Uh, one thing I would mention is that you might want to look into something uh, like a password vault program. There are several of them out there that I could recommend that you look into. Um, one of the ones that comes to mind is a program called LastPass. There's also one login. Um, there's a few of them out there, or even on a Mac computer, the Apple Keychain is a pretty good password vault for you. There are good programs out there that help you manage your passwords, but they're also secure. They keep them out of the browser, and they allow you to quickly and easily generate long, complicated passwords, and then it helps you save them. Um, because many of us have hundreds of passwords we have to remember, it feels like, or, or legitimately hundreds of them. And because of that, you know, it becomes difficult to manage, difficult to remember. And so try to find secure ways of keeping your passwords from being compromised. But remember when, you know, one of the major services that you subscribe to becomes hacked, it's entirely possible that your uh, password at that service is compromised in that process. Uh, which means if you've used it elsewhere, they'll, they might be able to figure out and find that and then gain access to other things where you're using that same password. Um, also be care, beware of phishing emails. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's, there's actually things called phishing, vishing, and smishing, which we've got a slide here about that in a minute. I'm going to explain that, but it's just about being careful about the, the communications you receive. Um, and the other thing is remember, if a service allows you the opportunity to set up your phone to receive a text code when you log in or uh, the ability to receive a code in some other way, that's called multi-factor authentication. And I would just encourage you to embrace that because it is one of the number one things you can do to prevent your username and password causing a compromise. Because even if they can guess that username and password, they're still going to have to get that text or the code that comes from the multi-factor from some other way, and that makes it a lot more difficult. And you know, to be honest, there are ways they can get around that as well, but since you've got it on, it makes you not low-hanging fruit. It makes you a little harder to get to, and they'll just move on to a, a target that is lower hanging fruit. Uh, and as long as that remains true, that's a really great way. But to be perfectly frank, that's just the world we live in now. Uh, and so embracing multi-factor authentication is highly recommended, certainly for your business um, and at, at a personal level, wherever available. Um, and then simply poor password management. I kind of hinted already to this, um, not using long passwords. One tip I would give you is instead of thinking of a, say, 20 character word, maybe think of a 20 character sentence that you could type as your passphrase instead of your password. Uh, so rather than saying, you know, apples is my password, say, I really like red apples is my password. Um, that could be an easy way to remember, but also still make it long. It has become statistically proven that the number one way to have a good password is to make it long. In fact, if you can get past that 16 character line, that's a really big one on ease of being hacked uh, or the password being guessed through some type of attack uh, solution. And so... Um, really work hard on seeing if you can get to passphrases. In fact, complexity isn't so much as important as it once thought was. You know, whether you have extra characters or upper or lowercase numbers, it's really about the length of password is the number one thing you can do. Now, added complexity does add more to the ability uh, uh, of protecting your password as well, but get them longer is the biggest tip there. And then if you have an office, be very careful about how people can remote in or for folks that are working from home. There has been an over 300% increase in attacks since the COVID pandemic began. And I think it can relate directly to the folks working from home and, and businesses that weren't prepared for remote workers suddenly just opening things up in an insecure way. So be very careful when somebody says, hey, let's set up a RDP connection or a remote desktop connection or a VPN. Those, of course, can be done securely, but they need to be done in the correct way. They need to be properly encrypted. They need to use multi-factor authentication. And without some of those restrictions in place, you're really just making it too easy to be found. And, and a lot of folks say, well, I'm not a big target. But the reality of it is, is the vast majority of tax are not discriminate on whether you're a big business, a small business, or a rich or a poor person, or have lots of computers or only a few computers. Really anything on the internet is a target and can be found, and it will be checked and tried. 
Uh, and so it's just a matter of seconds. In fact, they did a test to see how long a computer uh, coming online unprotected will be found and exploits attempted on it. And they tried it in many different regions of the world. They found the one that took the longest to be found happened to be in Ireland when they ran the test. And it took 47 seconds for it to be online before it was found and something was trying something on it. That was the longest one before it was found. And so just have to remember, if you're on the internet, you are a potential target and you should be thinking about how to protect these, these things. So one thing that I think is really important, and I, and I hope this isn't going too fast for you all, this is, I hope, good and helpful information for you. Um, there's a couple of things I think to pay attention about the concept of phishing uh, and some new terms. I, I, perhaps you've seen these before, or perhaps I'm introducing them to you now for the first time. Uh, but the concept of phishing, smishing, and vishing is really one of the really productive ways that hackers gain access to information that helps them get into systems and then begin attacks of the various kinds of, of information stealing or ransomware. And the whole concept is, is in some way, they are going to trick you into thinking you're talking to somebody that you know that you would share secure information with. They're gonna trick you. They're gonna to pretend to be your accountant. They're gonna to pretend to be your boss. They're gonna send pretend to be your boss and ask you to go get a whole bunch of Home Depot gift cards. We've seen that one so many times. Uh, and so they go and they get the cash value. They give the code to the person. They think they've just given it to their boss, but what they really have done is given it to some hacker and just use the, those funds they 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 they're, they're off to be selling them so uh but phishing in general or ishing in all the various things is all about sending you some type of electronic communication um and trying to pretend that there's somebody that they are not um of course you guys have probably all experienced the I'm calling you about your car warranty call. That's an example. But there are also ones that pretend to be law enforcement, the IRS, uh, pretend to be court systems, pretend to be lawyers in general that are suing you or have a case matter, or pretending to be, um, uh, you know, companies that you've won something um, that you didn't remember actually putting in for, you know. But it, the the very the very basic concept is they're going to send you something and, and try to get you to respond and give them secure information that will help them in attacking you. So um, phishing is the act of sending an email that is going to try to trick you into giving up something or clicking on something you shouldn't that will cause problems. Smishing is uh, short for the SMS messaging, otherwise known as text messages that we all use on our phones become far more popular than emails and phone calls for many of us for communicating with each other. And so they'll send you fake texts looking to be like from a friend or somebody you know, and a look to get you to give up some information. Uh, and then the last one is vishing, which is phone calls or uh, voicemails, hence the V for vishing, uh, where they will leave you information or call and pretend to be somebody that they are not in order to give you information. So just remember, the IRS doesn't call you to get your password or your social security number. And Microsoft's not calling you to install any updates or applications or antivirus programs on your computer. They just don't call and ask for sensitive information. That's not how it works. And if you ever are concerned that you're being contacted legitimately by your bank or a lawyer or a law enforcement, don't respond to the original email or text or voicemail. Find that organization's information, their phone, a phone, or and just call and see if they really are reaching out to you if you have a concern or ask somebody that you know that is an expert in the IT field that knows how to identify that potentially as uh, incorrect or vishing, smishing or phishing information. And so they're gonna try to get things like passwords, routing numbers, bank accounts, approvals for transfers. They're gonna try to get personal information they can use in some way. That never should be sent over email, uh, SMS texting, voicemails or phone, unless you know for sure exactly who you're talking to and assume that they're going to try to trick you. So hopefully that helps clear up those concepts, those terms. So not only do you need to watch your email, but be careful of your texts and be careful of phone calls and voicemails that come to you. People may be working to deceive you. So, you know, it, it's probably worth noting here that um, 
we are just an IT provider. We have offices here in the Phoenix, Arizona, also in the San Francisco and the Atlanta area. We've been partnered with Versant Capital for a long time and helping them with. And I think it's probably worth noting or highlighting the excellent work they have done to be concerned about their customers and their clients and their vendors. And so I could tell you when I sit and talk with John and other members of the Versant team, we've had a lot of opportunities to make sure that we're doing everything we can to secure your information or our clients information and to make sure that they're running with a very high standard of cybersecurity defense in their environment. We've done the redesign uh, of the architecture and we put in new systems. We use the state of the art antivirus and endpoint protection. Um, we've added uh, firewalls that have significantly better security than a lot of others. We've implemented a two tier backup system. So it's, copied and separated and so if data were compromised we have a high degree of confidence that we could simply restore the data from the backup and it actually backs up many times during the day um, then we have a lot of active monitoring going on and we do a lot of reporting and quarterly meetings with their team to show them what's going on in their environment and where the risks are coming it's a constant ongoing conversation and to be perfectly frank i only wish everybody took their IT and their cyber defense as, as seriously as Versant does. But I think uh, I just wanted to take a minute to highlight that we've been helping them as their outsource provider for several years now. And, and, uh, and, and, and proudly we're glad to work with them and, and for the openness they have to hearing about what we're seeing out there in the field and the latest in IT security risk. And, and uh, they're very serious about doing the right thing. And, and we're very happy and proud to work with them in that regard. And so I, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, I feel our, our partnership with them is really in a great place and we appreciate them. And one of the reasons why I'm happy to come on and present for their webinar here today. Um, so some things for you to think about um, in your business that can help with the process of reducing your cybersecurity risk. One of the things you may not know, and, and this is something that we offer to uh, our business customers, but there are actually specific organizations out there that do cybersecurity or cyber awareness training. And those are really effective tools for making sure that not only uh, you who has maybe heard this webinar or has taken other uh, courses or been trained in some way to understand the risks of cybersecurity uh, and the things to do to prevent it, but you're making sure every one of your employees also has had that training with some good thorough um, uh, 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 videos and uh, different emails and information uh, passed along. So we happen to uh, work with a company called Know Before. Um, that's one of the major ones out there. That's K-N-O-W-B-E and then the number four. Um, they provide excellent training. You sign up for it on an annual basis um, and it will provide monthly emails and monthly videos that uh, and quizzes and whatnot to make sure that you and your team are properly trained. And I feel like that's that's one of the best things you can actually do for your security is to make sure that you don't really have any weak links uh, of somebody who's just not informed in your organization. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, oh no, I think we're pretty smart. We, we know we're pretty savvy. And then lo and behold, they had that one person that just got fooled by that one phishing email that one day and they had a problem because of it. So I just encourage you to think about all the ways that you can increase your cybersecurity awareness training and uh, to look uh, for resources that, that can help you increase your knowledge. And in, in the workplace environment, all the staff and how they need to be careful of their clients' information, much the way Versant uh, approaches it. Um, also, multi-factor authentication, whenever and wherever you can turn that on, that's a great way to slow down or even stop uh, attackers from getting into your environment because they can't simply gain a username and password and gain access anymore. They have to also be able to receive the text or get the code from the app. And that, that second factor makes you less desirable as an attack surface. And that's a really big way to reduce how many people might come at you. And as, as I also referred to earlier, increasing the length of your passwords is important. And so think phrases instead of words, because I can't tell you how many 20 character words I know but it doesn't take a very long or very hard to remember sentence at all to come up with a passphrase when presented. Um, another thing that's really good to mention is, uh, you know, there are a lot of services out there that now monitor the dark web. Um, now, the dark web is kind of a funny thing because all the dark web is, is the same internet you and I get on, but it's all held 
in places that are encrypted and secured and private so that they're not regulated and people can't publicly walk in and see what's going on in these organizations necessarily. And to be perfectly frank, much of the hacking community works on programs that access in the dark web or work in these communities and these poster, these areas where they pass information on. They sell attacks to people that they can buy and then use to implement a ransomware attack on somebody. There are entire marketplaces for it. Uh, people operate like a business almost. Um, and there are also identity theft forums where if they go into a, an organization and compromise a bunch of usernames and passwords or personal information, they'll put it up for sale. And there are organizations out there now that will monitor. You can put in your name, your email address, and it will actually tell you if your name and email and your password are out there on an identity theft forum being up for sale. And if they are, then that means that somewhere along the line, one of the services you use has been compromised. It's amazing to me. We, we offer this service to our, our business customers and uh, almost always when we turn it on, there is at least a few that are up on an identity theft forum within their employees using their business email address. And oftentimes there are legitimate passwords being sold that we can show them. Here's the password that's out there on the forum. And then uh, they can, of course, quickly go, oh, I shouldn't use that password anymore. I need to change it anywhere I'm using it. And that's the main, main value of the dark web monitoring is to see what information is out there. If there's a password out there, just make sure you're not using it anywhere. Um, but the uh, there are several services that do dark web monitoring. Uh, many of the same organizations that do credit watching for you will also use dark web monitoring and tell you if you, you have a compromised issue with your personal information or your password. Um, there's a nice website out there where you can just quickly go and check your own uh, email address real quick and just see what shows up. It's called Have I Been Pwned? That's P-W-N-E-D at the end. Have I been P-W-N-E-D.com? Have I been pwned? Pwned is a hacker term for owning somebody. It, it's built off of a, uh, a spelling error that happened a long time that's just been constantly reiterated. But anyway, have I been pwned.com is a really great resource to pop out to and just check, put your email address in and see if there is anything out there that you could do manually today just from any website or just from any web browser. You can go to that website. Um, and also make sure that if you're working from home and or you're working on mobile, that you have good device security processes, that you are paying attention to your antivirus software, that it's actually functioning, that it's actually getting updates. Uh, I can't tell you how often I'll look at somebody's home computer and they've got some Norton antivirus subscription from two years ago and they think they're still protected, but they never re-upped it and it hasn't been updated in two years, you know. Uh, there's a few things you need to check to make sure you're taking care of home as well. One is, you know, have a good backup solution. Another is to make sure your endpoint protection is working. And to be perfectly frank, many of us don't like using usernames and passwords on home systems, but that's a big deal because then it's even easier to get into your system if they find a way. They don't even have to guess a username and password if you're not using one. And so I highly recommend that you set those up on home systems as well. So hopefully that's a, there's a few things in there that you've heard. You're like, maybe I can look into that. Or maybe you're looking at this list and saying, you know what? This is uh, pretty good. And I've got a pretty decent set uh, of, of things that I'm doing already. So good to know, right? But hopefully um, if there's something that's been at risk in your, in your environment, you're becoming a little bit more aware through this webinar. And there's a few more questions you can dig into or a few more things you can do to increase your ability to prevent a hack or to reduce your risk, as they say. So maybe there's some training or some MFA or mul as multi-factor authentication, or maybe you can work on your passwords or use a password vault or check the dark web. These are all things that would be very helpful for you or any business to be aware of and doing. <coughs> Excuse me. So with that being said, um, I, I appreciate all of you uh, attending today. Those of you that made it to the end here, thank you. Um, here at Snap Tech, we're kind of a goofy, fun bunch. This is some pictures of some of my team here. Uh, there is a, a resource on our website, snaptechit.com slash resources, where you, can, where you can read more information about compromises or more information about how to protect yourself. And uh, we appreciate the opportunity. And if we can ever help, just let us know. And so with that, I'd like to turn it back over to John and, and just thank you guys for the opportunity to share a few thoughts. And hopefully there's a few nuggets in there that was useful for you. 
Carl, thank you so much for that inf informative presentation on staying safe from cybercrime. Um, oh, definitely look What's that? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. No problem. I just say, hey, I just, I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity here, and there's some resources on our website, and we are happy to happy to present. And thank you for the opportunity, John. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to you, and and thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, we definitely look forward to our next talk with you. Um, and from all of us here at Versant Capital Management, uh, thank you for watching.